So each Sunday during the Hope Campaign, we um, are inviting someone to come from our community to share their hopes for this community. And uh, in the past couple of weeks, we've had leaders from different organizations. And this week, we don't have a leader from a formal organization, but a leader as an individual committed follower of Christ. And so as Pastor Nisi comes up here to join me, um, we're going to be talking today about how she shares hope with others as a way to encourage all of us as individuals to share hope with others. So Pastor Nisi, um, all of us are called by our passions and our experiences and our gifting to share hope in different ways. Where do you especially feel called? What kinds of situations to share hope? Well, first, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to add expression to that which I believe God put on my heart. And then I want to say thank God for the opportunity because I get to talk about Jesus. And uh, as you were sitting there, as you were uh, praying, the Lord just immediately spoke and told me to remind people that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they are safe. And so our safety is in God, knowing him. And so for me, because I've been through a whole lot and my heart is to help people recognize and realize just Receiving Jesus is a beautiful thing, but it's so much more to him to grow and to develop and know him. So as a minister of the gospel, my call is to get people to get to know my Lord and Savior so that they can have hope and that they can have trust. And I go about it in different ways. And one of the main ways that I reach people is I like to see families that have children and overwhelmed. Personally, I like to make them some food and take it to them, whether they know the Lord or not. In different companies in this community, such as the car dealerships and stuff, they know me as Pastor Nisi, but they also know me as, you know, the person that bring all kind of food. And that opens up a door where people can trust you, and then you can share your love for Jesus and encourage them. So for me, it's being available to the Holy Spirit to be free to release what God put in me to help people know that hope is Jesus. And that's what I do. Hmm. So I love how you use kind of your earthly passions for kingdom purpose. Um, and for you, it's cooking a yep. lot of times. Um, so how would you... How would you encourage other people to kind of explore what they do well, what they love doing, and using it for other people? Okay, so let's go back. To encourage people, you have to find where they're at. Because in my observation, most people are deeply hurt as a result of death, losing a loved one. That takes people from, they could be to 100 and drop to zero. When you understand the principle of God's love for you, that takes you from zero to 100. And so how I do certain things and encourage people is, for an example, the Lord showed me this day about the woman with the issue of blood. And he was passing by, and he was not thinking about her, but she sure was thinking about him. And she said to herself, if but I could just touch, just let me touch the hem of his garment, I would be made whole. Now, she carried that for 12 years, but her belief system was just let me get to something that's on him if I can't even get to him. And so I think because he's in us, when people get to us, and we represent him, it's not so much of what we say or what we do, but our who. And that's how I let people know. There, you can be in no situation in life that is so deep 
that God's not there with you or for you. But as a human being, we have to believe. We're, we're taught a lot about having faith. And we know that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. So our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And like, I'm a living witness. The power of God is greater than any problem because God is the problem solver. And so I encourage people and I encourage the people of God not to look at your do, but to look at your who. Who is this Jesus? So when you trust him, then you'll believe him. And that's how I really try to get through to people. It's not what you see, but it's who sees you. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you. Could I pray for you and as an extension of that, all of us as we learn more and more how to, how to offer hope to people because of the hope that we have? So, sure. God, I thank you for the life and witness and testimony of Pastor Nisi because of the way that you have testified in her life, God. I thank you that she knows that you are the who that gives her hope. And Lord, I thank you that that just overflows in her life to be shared with others. Lord, give us the same kind of um, passion and desire to help others have the hope that we know in Jesus Christ. God, because we know your word says that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And God, we want that kind of hope for people in the community around us. So Lord, let it be so. Let each of our lives give testimony to you, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Glory. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So um, our topic today is a hard topic. Um, there is a time for each one of us when hope regarding this early earthly life comes to an end. And it's called death. And death is never easy, but it is especially hard when someone takes their own life. I am guessing that almost every one of us here today has been affected by suicide in some way. You may know someone who has voiced thoughts about ending their life. You may know of someone who has completed suicide. You may have been devastated by the death of someone close to you. You may at some point in time have your own thoughts about ending your life, and you may have those thoughts right now. This is such a difficult topic to speak about, and I wish we didn't have to. But if the world is talking about suicide, then the church should also be part of the conversation because Jesus' followers have a unique perspective on hope. We have a short view on hope, and we have a long view on hope, and it's the long, eternal view that sustains us when hope in this earthly life is lost. In 2018, according to the CDC, suicide was the second leading cause of death for people between the ages of 10 and 34 years old. And it was the fourth leading cause of death for people 35 to 54. There were more than two and a half times as many suicides in the United States as there were homicides. Now, it is surprising. I was surprised in kind of looking this up 
this past week that there has not been evidence of an increase in the suicide rate in the U.S. during the pandemic so far. But the nation's mental health crisis is far from over, and medical experts are still concerned about the long-term effects that the pandemic and isolation and financial security and all of those other parts are going to have on mental health. And so even if the numbers remain the same, suicide is still a national crisis. There are lots of reasons why people contemplate or complete suicide. They include isolation, a sense of being a burden, unbearable physical or emotional pain, guilt, substance abuse, mental illness. Suicide is called the death of despair. And what it really means is that people have lost hope. Seven people in scripture ended their own lives. The person that may come to your mind first is Judas after he betrayed Jesus. The rest are Old Testament figures. Abimelech commanded his armor bearer to thrust his sword into him so that he would not go down in history that he was killed by the woman who mortally wounded him. Zimri burned down his house around himself after military defeat. As the Philistines closed in on King Saul, he fell on his own sword so that he would not have to suffer or die by their hand. And when he died, his armor bearer also fell on his own sword. Samson took his own life in order to carry out one final act of revenge against the Philistines. The seventh person took a very big risk that didn't pay off. His name was Ahithophel, and you may never have heard of him. He was King David's most trusted counselor, but when David and his third son Absalom had a major falling out, and Absalom tried to take the throne away from King David. Ahithophel betrayed David, and he joined the ranks of those who were helping Absalom overthrow his father's throne. Now we're going to pick up with Ahithophel's story in 2 Samuel, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 12. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor, to come from Gilo, his hometown. And so the conspiracy gained strength, and Absalom's following kept increasing. So as the movement gained strength, David knew that he had to flee Jerusalem to save his household and his officials and the people who still supported him. Scripture says that the whole countryside wept aloud as the procession passed by, traveling toward the wilderness where they would stay until David knew their next step. But David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, his head covered and he was barefoot. All the people with them, him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. Now David had been told, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. So David prayed, Lord, turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. When David arrived at the summit where people used to worship God, Hushai the archite was there to meet him, his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, if you go with me, you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, Your Majesty, I will be your servant. I was your father's servant in the past, but now I will be your servant. Then you can help me by frustrating Ahithophel's advice. 
So as Absalom and his supporters came to Jerusalem, Ahithophel went with him. And Absalom approached Ahithophel, his new counselor, for advice about what he should do next. And the 23rd verse of chapter 16 says, Now in those days, the advice of Ahithophel gave was like that of one who inquires of God. That was how both David and Absalom regarded all of Ahithophel's advice. So Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give us your advice. What should we do? Ahithophel answered, Sleep with your father's concubines, whom he left to take care of the palace. Then all of Israel will hear that you have made yourself obnoxious to your father, and the hands of everyone with you will be more resolute. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on a roof, and he slept with his father's concubines in the sight of of all Israel. Now in those days, taking possession of a king's concubines was not just a slap in the face. It was a declaration of one's right to the throne. Next, Ahithophel said to Absalom, I would choose 12,000 men and set out tonight in pursuit of David. I would attack him while he is weary and weak. I would strike him with terror, and then all the people with him will flee. I would strike down the, only the king and bring all the people back to you. The death of the man you seek will mean the return of all. All the people will be unharmed. This plan seemed good to Absalom and to all the elders of Israel. But unknown to Absalom, David had sent Hushai the archite back to Jerusalem to work his way into Absalom's trusted circle of counselors. David told Hushai that the best way he could help was to frustrate and counter Ahithophel's advice. So even though Ahithophel's plan sounded good, Absalom decided to get a second opinion from Hushai. Absalai said, summon also Hushai the archite so we can hear what he has to say as well. When Hushai came to him, Absalom said, Ahithophel has given this advice. Should we do what he says? If not, give us your opinion. Hushai replied to Absalom, the advice Ahithophel has given is not good this time. And Hushai went on to suggest a different plan. And after hearing that plan, Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the advice of Hushai the archite is better than that of Ahithophel. For the Lord had determined to frustrate the good advice of Ahithophel in order to bring disaster on Absalom. When Ahithophel saw that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He put his house in order and then hanged himself. So he died and was buried in his father's tomb. You know, earlier I gave a a one-sentence summary about why each of the seven people in the Bible committed suicide, but that is way too simple. We never really understand all of the things that play into a person's decision. Buried in two separate verses in other chapters of 2 Samuel that you have to put together is the fact that Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather. The seeds of Ahithophel's bitterness and betrayal probably started growing years earlier when his granddaughter's husband Uriah and his great-grandson died because of King David's immoral actions. 
The bottom line of all these stories is that despair and loss of hope is not just a 21st century problem. It's a human problem. And it's not just a problem for the weak in faith. The Bible records many other people, leaders and people of great faith, who at some time in their lives felt such despair that they wished their lives could end. People like King Solomon, Rebecca, the prophet Elijah, Job, Jonah, and even the Apostle Paul. I can't begin to answer all the questions that we might have about suicide today. It's such a nuanced topic, especially when you start to bring in things like euthanasia and withdrawing medical help or or stopping to take nourishment at the end of life. And even if I had all the time in the world, I don't have all the answers. But I want to offer some beginning answers to three questions that I think are important this morning. The first question we might ask is, is suicide a sin? And I believe it is for several reasons. The first is that suicide involves taking into our own hands decisions that rightfully belong to God. Scripture tells us repeatedly that God has determined each person's days and purpose before we are ever born. I think suicide goes against God's will because it's not just about a loss of hope. It's about a lack of faith. In Psalm 13, the psalmist cried out to God asking, how long are you going to hide your face from me, Lord? Are you going to forget me forever? How long do I have to wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? Turn and answer me. Give light to my eyes or I'm going to die. Yet even in the midst of that depth of despair, and all those unanswered questions the psalmist had. He said, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I think suicide is a sin that goes against God's will because taking our own life causes overwhelming grief for those you love. Sometimes people take their lives because they believe that it will be easier for the loved ones they leave behind. But you know what? It's not. And instead, those loved ones are left struggling with unbearable grief and pain, guilt and confusion, and agonizing questions they will never get answers to this side of eternity. But the second question is, is suicide the unforgivable sin? Through the centuries, committed believers and intelligent biblical scholars have wrestled with that deep question and they've come up with different answers. I'm going to tell you what I believe. Scripture does not state that suicide is unforgivable. And you will not find a specific prohibition against self-killing in the Bible. Now that doesn't mean it's right. But as you read each of those seven stories about suicide in Scripture, none of them includes a warning that it is the unforgivable sin. Some people would say it's unforgivable because a person dies without being able to repent of the sin. But friends, most of us are going to die without repenting of all of our sins, either because we're too proud or we're clueless 
or because we're going to die in the midst of a sinful thought or action ourselves. So if I were to die in the middle of an argument with Tim, would I lose my salvation? If an unkind thought was the last conscious thought I had, would I lose my salvation? I believe that I'm going to have to answer for those things. But the good news of the gospel is that my sins and your sins are not greater than the healing and the redeeming power of Jesus' death on the cross. If Christ's sacrifice covers every sin and a person has accepted Christ as their Savior, then suicide is horrific and it is heartbreaking, but not unforgivable. So the third question is, does our faith offer any hope in these situations? And it does. The Christian faith offers hope for today and it offers hope for eternity. For today, our hope is knowing this. You are created in God's image, the Imago Dei. And it doesn't matter what you look like or how smart you are or what anyone else thinks about you. It doesn't matter what you have accomplished or what you have failed in doing. You are precious. And you have God-ordained value simply because the creator of the universe says so. No matter what you or the world says, we are God's masterpiece, Scripture says. And God has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Our lives have meaning and purpose even when it is hard to see. Secondly, our hope is not just about this life. If all we have to look forward to is this life, then honestly, we should all be drowning in despair. Because this life is broken, and it's painful, and it's finite. Instead, our hope is built on the conviction of things not yet seen, as Pastor Nisi said. But they have been promised by our creator, redeemer, and sustainer of the world. For in this hope we were saved, Paul said to the Christians in Rome. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what they see. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Some of you might remember our niece, Annie. She came here a couple years ago and played cello at both of our services that day. Well, she just completed her graduate cello recital in March. And during this hour-plus-long recital, Annie played a piece called Let Us Breathe by Jeffrey Mumford. Mr. Mumford is a black composer who is commissioned by the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra to write a one-minute cello piece after the death of George Floyd. Annie met with Mr. Mumford by Zoom, and she practiced the piece with him, and she asked questions about how to make sure that she was musically making sense of that complex precisely notated rhythms he had written into the piece. She wanted to make sure that she was being faithful to his creation. Mr. Mumford explained that there is no tangible beat in that piece, and it's on purpose to echo the lack of control that Floyd had over his body because he was black. 
The moments of silence are just as important as the notes, he said, because they give a sense of someone gasping for breath. Annie got permission from Mr. Mumford to record the song for us today. And I'm going to warn you, it's hard to listen to, as it should be. It is dissonant, disconnected, and raw. But at the final moment of those 60 seconds, just when it seems unbearable, the piece ends with this quiet trill in the higher register of the cello. Mr. Mumford said, the last note I see as a ray of hope that we can finally realize a genuine respect for humanity. If you aren't careful, if you're not listening, or if the sound and the noise around you drowns it out, you're going to miss that final trill. I did the first time I listened to it. Every time I listen to this piece, I almost miss the trill of hope. I have to strain to hear it. That must be what it's like for people of color each time the tiny trill of hope is eclipsed by anger and terror and sadness. That might be what it's like for you or someone you know struggling to find hope in the midst of despair. I know that the only reason that I can hear that trill in the cello piece is because I was told it's there and I'm listening for it. In the same way, I know that the only way that we'll be able to hear the trill of hope in this life is if we put our hope in the one who came to offer us a hope that cannot be destroyed by the sin and the brokenness of this world. If you are experiencing deep despair, a loss of hope, or having thoughts about ending your life, tell someone, your pastor, a Christian friend, a trusted adult. Your pain is probably bigger than that person can solve, but ask them to help you find the help and the hope 
you need. Do not go through this alone. There is hope. And the hope that is greater than anything else you are facing has a name. It's Jesus. Pray with me. Lord God, thank you for that trill of hope on the cross. For Christ's words, it is finished. God, he wasn't talking about hope being finished in those words. He was talking about everything that destroys hope being finished because of the power of the resurrection. Lord, help us to see the long view of hope in this hard life. Help us to know that hope has a name. It's Jesus. And that hope is a gift called salvation and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.